Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Joining us for our inaugural episode is John Missel. John and his wife, Mary Lou, are historians and authors who have written extensively on Florida's Seminole Indian Wars. Their works include detailed histories, biographies, and two award-winning novels. The couple's latest books are The Seminole Struggle, A History of America's Longest Indian War. It is available from the Pineapple Press. And The History of the Third Seminole War, co-authored with Dr. Joe Kanetch and available from Casemate Books. Both works can be found at our foundation website at www.seminalwars.us. John Missel, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, my pleasure to be here, Patrick. Um, Before we get to our big three questions, first things first, what were the Seminole Wars? They were um, a series of wars between the United States and Seminole Indians to remove the Seminole from Florida, send them out west. So how did the Seminole Wars come to be? Well, as residents of what was then Spanish Florida, the Seminole had always had an antagonistic relationship with the lawless settlers of backwoods Georgia. In addition, the United States coveted Florida for security and economic reasons. This led to sporadic military confrontations starting in 1812, and culminating in what became known as the First Seminole War in 1818. Spain came to realize that if they didn't sell Florida, the United States would simply take it. So they agreed to cede the territory to the United States in 1819. After Florida became the United States territory, the government instituted a policy first to contain and then to remove the Seminoles to lands west Mississippi in what is now Oklahoma. Besides being traditional adversaries, the Seminoles also occupied the most valuable land in the peninsula, having been here for generations, and which the government wanted to sell to the land-hungry settlers. Another factor that fueled the push for their removal was the fact that they all often welcomed runaway slaves which, of course, didn't fit well with the southern slaveholders. Now, the Seminoles steadfastly resisted the pressure to remove, and that resulted in open warfare, first in 1835 to 1842, in what's been called the Second Seminole War, and then again in 1855 to 1858. Now, it's important to bear in mind that these neat divisions of three Seminole Wars lies the fact that for nearly half a century there was intense pressure upon the Seminole to give up their Florida homes. Sometimes it was openly military, but at other times it might be diplomatic or social pressure. What we need to understand is that while white Floridians could go about their normal business during times of relative peace, for the Seminole, this pressure was constant in part of their daily lives. So how were these wars fought once they began? Initially, the United States attempted to fight the Seminole using the standard tactics of Napoleonic warfare and hoping to overwhelm the natives with large columns of soldiers. Although these tactics were effective in 1818, they failed in the later conflicts against the Seminole adversary that was adept at guerrilla warfare and was able to move freely through the unmapped Florida wilderness. In the end, the U.S. military resorted to a war of attrition in order to wear down the Seminole resistance. So when you say Napoleonic tactics, one thinks of big, wide battlefields in, uh, say, present-day Belgium for the Battle of Waterloo and other places. Florida strain doesn't exactly lend itself to that. No, no, it doesn't. Um, you know, these were tactics 
that we had used during the War of 1812 against the British, and that's what was taught at West Point and what the Army was used to. Um, down here in Florida, it simply didn't work. Um, you had to trudge through swamps. You didn't know the terrain. There were no good maps of the interior of Florida. White men simply hadn't been there. So it was a totally different environment. For the first year of the war, the Army was very embarrassed. In our series, we'll get into specific battles, specific skirmishes, uh, tactics and so forth used, and how campaigns went. Uh, not our place in this podcast, which is more of an overview. So that's why I'm going to get off speaking about how they were fought and go to the third big question, how and why do they still resonate? Well, militarily, it was the United States' first real experience with a prolonged guerrilla war, and we did not do well. Unfortunately, many of the military and political lessons that should have been learned never were, and resulting in long, no-win contests, such as Vietnam and Afghanistan. Um, sometimes forgotten when we speak of the Seminole Wars that the lasting effect they had on the thousands of Seminoles who were shipped out west and the descendants of those people. For them, the war may have been over, but the suffering certainly didn't cease. Also, the Seminole Wars led directly to the exploration and settlement of Florida. Most of Peninsula Florida's major cities began life as military posts erected during the Seminole War. Got Fort Lauderdale, Fort Myers, Fort Pierce. Those are obvious, but there are many like Tampa, Orlando, and Miami that have not retained their military names, but that's where people first settled. Most notably, the descendants of the several hundred Seminole who eluded capture and refused to surrender their homeland, rightly claim their unconquered status and have become a proud symbol of the state. They've also become a political and economic force, not only within Florida, but throughout the nation. And they're, they're a living example of the tenacity of the human spirit. How did you and Mary Lou get involved in the study of the Seminole Wars in the first place? Well, Mary was working on her master's degree and needed a subject for her thesis. A close friend of ours, Annette Snap, suggested she do it on the Seminole Ward, because there wasn't really much written on it at the time. Neither of us had ever actually even heard of the Seminole Ward. And as we looked into the subject, we realized it's an important part of American history that had been largely ignored. I became interested in the subject, along with her and began to help with some of the research. But the one thing we couldn't find was a single book that covered all three wars and the big picture. And so after Mary finished the thesis and earned her degree, we decided to expand our research and ended up writing our first, first book, The Seminole Wars, which was published by the University Press of Florida. You've revised that book. Yes, that's our new book, The Seminole Struggle. The, uh, the one, original one was out for about 15 years, and of course, in space 15 years, you learn a lot, um, both new stuff and correcting some misconceptions that we had in our original work. And so we came out with a, with a basically a totally revised edition. Well, we'll have you back to discuss that book on a future episode. You have a relationship with the Seminole Wars Foundation. What is that relationship? Well, early in our research, one of Mary's acquaintance from the engineering firm where she worked was Dr. Joe Kanesh, a state historian who has an encyclopedic knowledge of the Seminole Wars, among many other subjects. <laughs> he introduced us to the foundation, and we became actively involved. I served as president for several years, and we published a newsletter and maintained the website and membership list, and oversaw the publication of several foundation books. We've also written two books for the foundation. Um, one was The Miserable Pride of a Soldier, which is the biography of Colonel William S. Foster, and This Torn Land, which is a collection of Seminole War-related poetry from the period. And after about 15 years of such work, we've retired from the active running of the organization and now serve on the foundation's advisory board. 
people can see you at the Seminole Wars Foundation table at different battle reenactments. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's about a half dozen battle reenactments held at various parks throughout the state during the winter months. Uh, some of them are large events with as many as 100 reenactors, soldier and Seminole. Mary and I attend most of them where we set up a table for the Seminole Wars Foundation to answer questions and to sell books, both our own and the foundation. Personally, I narrate two of the battles and give some sort of presentation at most of the others. And, of course, we encourage your listeners to attend any one of these events to help gain an understanding of what went on during this period. Sure, and I've been to all of these as well. They're quite, they're fun. Definitely. What's your relationship with the Seminole Tribe of Florida? Uh, nothing official, but we do have many close friends within the tribe and at the Atatiki Tribal Museum. Uh, the one thing I think we're most proud of is our recent collaboration with Willie Johns, who's a tribal historian and chief justice of the Seminole court system. We've done a novel entitled What We Have Endured that is due out this year from the Florida Historical press, and it's our fourth book with that organization. It's unusual in that it follows the Seminole Wars from the perspective of a Seminole woman who suffered through the entire 46-year conflict. All three of us wanted to present the wars from a Native view, and while it is fiction, it follows the events of the war very closely uh, to the point where we actually included a, about a 15-page timeline at the back of the book so that the reader could understand just what was going on and how long and tragic these wars were. That is something that I think gets lost in uh, many of the books written because they're written by um, non seminoles let's say. Yeah, though, you know, Mary and I are non seminal of course, that's, that's why we worked with Willie, because he, he knows the history and, and especially the culture because, you know, I... I know little aspects of the culture, but it's not my culture. And so, you know, having Willie along, that kind of kept us on track and added to the book, um, you know, a lot of that cultural detail. What's the most important thing you've learned about these long wars with the Seminole from the American perspective? Uh, that you can't just go in and drive somebody out of their home. They're going to fight. And when you want to, if you want to make somebody hold on to something, make something dear to somebody, try taking it away from them. If you, if you don't try to take something away from somebody, if you hadn't tried to drive the Seminole out, they would have basically probably assimilated just like, you know, immigrants to this country did, you know, a century or two ago. Um, but instead, by trying so hard to get them out, it just made them much more tenacious to hold on to what they had. As we near our close, John, tell, you, listener, tell our listeners, please, how they can learn more about you and Mary Lou's work on the Seminole Wars. You have a website? Yes, we do. It's um, www.missile.net, and that's spelled M-I-S-S-A-L-L. Very important. When I write your name down, I'm always forgetting the last L for some reason. Yeah, but most people do. <laughs> Gotten used to it. When they get to the website, they'll find a short history of the war and a list of our books. Uh, they'll also see a calendar of reenactments and any other Seminole War-related events uh, or any speaking engagements we may have lined up. Glad you're getting the word out. Yes, uh, this is a this is an exciting endeavor to start here, and I'm very proud to have you on as our inaugural guest. And even though there's much more to explore about the Seminole Wars than time is allowed today, I want our listeners to know that this is just the first of many episodes uh, to come about the Seminole Wars. We've discussed much today uh, about this neglected period of armed conflict in our nation's history. It's sandwiched in the calendar between the War of 1812 and the Mexican War of the late 1840s and mostly forgotten, as you've mentioned, John. To find out more in the coming weeks and months and, God willing, years, I shall speak with historians such as John, archaeologists, anthropologists, 
archivists, writers, novelists, painters, musicians, curators, exhibitors, craftsmen, educators, park rangers, military era reenactors of both the US Army and the state or territorial militia, and to the descendants of the Seminole who fought so defiantly and valiantly to stay in Florida. Stay tuned and thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep the show going. Visit our website at www.seminolewars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted, the Seminole Wars Podcast 2020, all rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden, Roast em, provided by kind permission of Rita Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman, all rights reserved.